All right, we're coming to chapter 20. And as I mentioned, the first thing this morning, what is very common throughout Ezekiel, actually it's common throughout the scripture, is, okay, if you didn't get it the first time, let me try again. Okay? And uh, there's repetition. So when we come to chapter 20, we come to a new set of messages in the seventh year, in the fifth month, on the tenth day. Oh, we changed days. Okay. So we're on the 10th day. This is uh, in the period of July, August. Uh, I, I won't take time to explain why I say July, August, except you have to realize there are different calendrical uh, systems that can throw things off slightly, depending on which system is being used. But July, August, uh, nine, uh, 591 B.C. It's 11 months since Ezekiel delivered the previous series of messages as far as the dating. And here we're going to have, uh, once again, a, some, a review and basically a historical review. Uh, history is significant because it really, you, you, you cannot deny it, it happened <laughs> in that sense. And so we constantly see God going back to remind the people of Israel, just look. If you want to know why this is happening, just look at your history. Now they've argued, you know, they've argued at this point. We've, we've spent the, these last chapters about a number of their concerns, a number of the issues that bother them, things that uh, are, they don't think is right, and the things they argue about. And one of those has to do with, are we paying for our history? And in essence, what God is saying is your history is only getting worse. <laughs> and you're, you're at the worst part and this is, just look at this and you ask a question whether God shouldn't be bringing discipline. You know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out yes at that point. But you can change, okay? But it's a constant reminder and it's part of it. It's there to, to put conviction upon them. Look at it. Here it is. It's right up to today. So... Is there justification? Yes, there is. Not that God needs to be vindicated. Not that God needs to be justified in what he does. But God has no problem just showing us that this is right. Now, the, there is news at this time, historically, of uh, victories that the Egyptians are having in Sudan. Okay? The rumors are growing. Rumors are growing that Pesamitic II would conquer Palestine. Exiles are getting excited. Their expectations are heightened. Zedekiah had shared this excitement back, you know, home in Jerusalem and the same views when he revolt, revolted against Babylon. This is really what drove him to do that. The only problem is, as I implied in uh, just not too long ago today, uh, this Pharaoh becomes ill and Egypt's might never materialized. And of course, God told them that's what would happen in the situation. Now we read here that uh, at this time, some of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and they sat down in front of me. Now he's still mute. He's still in his home. We do not know the nature of the inquiry. The text does not tell us. Uh, maybe they are asking the question. This is purely speculation on my part. Uh, maybe they're asking the question at this point, would Zedekiah bring freedom from exile? That's been certainly on their heart. They want that, so that would be uh, certainly a legitimate way. And uh, we'd like to ask the Lord how soon it will be before we return to Canaan. You know, perhaps. Those are the things that are on their heart. We don't know. Uh, we only have the text telling us, so to speak, the answer to the silent request. Uh, and inquiry here that it was never made on their part. Chapters 20 to 23, uh, which uh, these are given under this uh, at this particular date, is the Lord's, in a sense, uh, response to whatever their unspoken question is an inquiry 
And what he's going to do in his response to them is to once again show them that Israel's history is one of persistent rebellion against God. Okay? That's, we're going to see that uh, as he begins to describe all of this uh, starting in verse 5. And he begins in 2, The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, speak to the elders of Israel and say to them, This is what Adonai Yahweh says. Have you come to inquire of me? As sure as I live, I will not let you inquire of me, declares the sovereign your Lord. But judge them. Tell them. I'll tell you what I want you to hear, regardless of what your question may be. Here's what you need to know. Uh, by the way, there are times in ministry where we need to instruct people in what they need to know, in a sense, whether they want to know it or not. And people are often hesitant about that. That's a real tricky one when you come to missions. Because in missions we want to go to help the church in that place. But I'm not convinced, having been involved in missions for 19 years, that we go and do whatever the church in that place asks us to do. Uh, for example, if in most of the situations in Russia, uh, if I ask them, what can I do for you? The same would be in Ukraine. Come and teach. I, they'll never develop their own education if I always teach for them. You, you understand what I'm saying? Now, I'm not, nothing against Russia and Ukraine. It would be true anywhere. But I, I'm just using it as an illustration. And so I work with them by asking questions and so forth to help them come to the place to see that we need to train the nationals ultimately to do what I might do initially. Okay? But I don't just sit there and say, okay. Because it's not for their well-being. It's not the best for them. Okay? So uh, we sometimes need to speak to things people need to hear, whether it's the question they're asking or not at that point. Okay? So that's exactly what God does here, and he is, shows the history, and in doing so, I hope you see in all this his gracious long-suffering. God is so patient, so gracious, so long suffering with Israel. I don't, I, I wouldn't have made it. <laughs> you know, uh, that's the way he is, and that's the way he is with you and me. Don't presume upon it, however, we shouldn't do that. But God is so gracious. So he shows that graciousness. He will point out that Nebuchadnezzar is coming soon. And that it is because of Judah's wickedness, especially her leaders, that her wickedness was full. So we're going to begin in verse 5 with taking different, he's going to talk about the rebellion of Israel at different points in their history. And he's going to start with Egypt. Okay, So if you can put your mind historically, we're not going to deal with any of the history of the patriarchs, okay? Genesis is out, okay? We're going to kind of come over here uh, to the end of Genesis and the beginning of Exodus, and we're in Egypt, okay? And by the way, this text is going to tell some things about that time that you're not going to find in Genesis and Exodus. That's, again, the value of the prophets at times, of the comments, and the input, and the insight they will give us on other portions of the scripture. So we read here as uh, in, in verse 5. This is what Adonai Yahweh says. On the day I chose Israel. You see, Israel is, uh, he is, the, is beginning to be formed. When he, and the Abraham comes and God says he's going to create a nation. Eventually you've got three parts to form. You've got to have people, you've got to have a land, you have to have some sort of government. Okay. The people are being continually promised and developed throughout the whole of the book of Genesis with the promise concerning both the seed and the land. 
with the people you know are being that's being delineated and uh, through Abraham then Isaac okay and then through Jacob and then we see this, the 12 sons and so forth that's all being developed and those people come down to Egypt and in Egypt of course the they multiply to approximately 2 million people okay so he's in Egypt at a time where uh, the nation is being is starting to come together it doesn't actually all come together they're not really a nation till the end of the conquest when they have a place to live so he says i uh, I swore with uplifted hand to the descendants of the house of Jacob and reveal myself to them in Egypt. With uplifted hand I said to them, I am Yahweh your God. <laughs> Interesting. That's what he's wanting the people now to know. Okay. They obviously don't. On that day I swore to them that I would bring them out of Egypt into a land I had searched out for them. A land flowing with milk and honey, the most beautiful of all the lands. And I said to them, each of you get rid of the vile images you have set, set your eyes upon and do not defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am Yahweh your God, not them. That's what I told you there, okay? But they rebelled against me and would not listen to me. They did not get rid of the vile images they had set their hearts on, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. So, I said I'd pour out my wrath on them and spend my anger against them in Egypt. But for the sake of my name, I did what would keep it from being profaned in the eyes of the nations in which, among which they lived, and whose sight I had revealed myself to the Israelites by bringing them out of Egypt. Do you ever get the idea when you read Genesis and Exodus that they worshipped idols in Egypt? No. In fact, one of the reasons I'm convinced that Joseph went down there and uh, was used of God as a tremendous instrument at that time was to seek to preserve the people from the syncretism of Canaan in which you already had Judah going into sacred prostitutes of these thought he did, actually was his daughter-in-law, where you have the sons want killing, you know, seeking to kill one another. I mean, you certainly didn't have a whole lot of unity among the people of God, among the sons of, J of Jacob. And uh, this, uh, the land of Canaan, of the syncretistic religion is just absorbing. You can see the process of just, <laughs> just sucking them right in, okay? And God says, no, I'm going to take you to a land of segregation. Uh, I'm not, God's not condoning segregation. But he took them to a land of Egypt because the Egyptians, and you read in their writings, the Egyptians said, we're people. Everybody else wasn't. I don't know what everybody else was. <laughs> but according to the Egyptians, they weren't people. It's so like when you come to the New Testament, you know, there's the Greeks. And who are the, who they, who's all the rest of the people? Barbarians. Okay. Well, uh, you know, different countries kind of have that perspective in history you know they're it and there is nobody else well Egyptians did that and where did they do and when they came down the brothers came down to Joseph and they ate together and the Egyptians sat at one table and Joseph sat at another table and his brothers sat at another one because the Egyptians didn't associate with the foreigners even Joseph was at a separate table even though he was the prime minister there was this segregational perspective on their part. And where did they put them in the land? The land of Goshen over there. Out there. They're by themselves. And I think God did this was in a, an attempt to, to preserve them from the syncretism. But they still were in Egypt. And you can see their heart already. And I think that's exactly what, what God's revealing here in the history of them. Even at that time the eyes were going idols other gods and of course you see that later when they come out you know. so he says I told them at that time get rid of them get rid of them but they rebelled against me in, in verse 8 and he said they did not rid themselves of the vile images they had set their eyes on nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt so I said I would pour out my wrath on them and spend my anger against them in Egypt as we've read 
and I will keep, uh, will keep myself, uh, my name, from being profaned by bringing them out. Because if it left them in there and let them be totally judged, the people of the nations would have said, "Who? what about their God? Plus he's wanting to redeem. So he brought them out. They, they, they weren't always coming with, yes, we trust you, God. I, I can, you know, you just view that situation in Exodus 14 where they're right before the Reed Sea. And here comes the Egyptians over the hill. And uh, they're standing there and everybody is scared spitless. You know, they have no, they have no weapons, they have no nothing. Here comes the Egyptian army. And Moses stands up and says, stand still. That's the very last thing you want to do in that case. You want to run as fast as you can. <laughs> you know, stand still. Take your seats in the bleachers, please. We're going to have a nice show today. You want to watch this one? The Lord's going to fight for us today. You know, praise God for Moses. Moses is, you know, there are people like that that will stand in the gap for the people. Moses trusted God and people were scared to death and of course they all rejoiced and it was so marvelous when the when the sea parted and they went across and they got on the other side and they had this big celebration and three days later they were wondering where God was sounds just like some of us okay. so that's the context we're in at the beginning of their history that he's talking here in Egypt and uh, they were having difficulty with Egyptian idols and vile images. And there's a prolonged discipline, even in Egypt. They stayed there for quite a while, and it appears that they got into the uh, idols and, the, and these things pretty quickly. And they were there, as you know, 430 years. And uh, then God brought them out. And he promised to bring them into the land that he had uh, charged them that uh, he, uh, he would bring them and he charged them to get them to get rid of the idols and they rebel. So when we come to verse 10. Uh, we read there where he says, therefore I led them out of Egypt and brought them into the desert. So verses 10 to 12, we have the rebellion in the wilderness. We had rebellion in Egypt. Now we talk about the rebellion in Egypt. He first of all talks about uh, the blessings that he had poured out upon them. I gave them my decrees there. I made to know to them my laws. For as a man obeys them, he will live by them. I gave them my Sabbaths. I, it was a sign between them that they would know that I, Yahweh, made them holy. These are the blessings I gave upon them. I set them all apart. You know. But then we read about the rebellion in verse 13. Uh, yet... The people of Israel rebelled, rebelled against me in the desert. They did not follow my decrees, but rejected my laws. Although the man who obeys them will live by them. And they utterly de desecrated my Sabbath. So I said, I will pour out my wrath on them and destroy them in the desert. And he says, but for the sake of my name, I did, I did what would keep it from being profane in the eyes of the nation in whose sight I brought them out. So with uplifted hand, I swore to them in the desert that I would not bring them into the land that I had given, that I had given them, a land flowing with milk and honey. And you know the story of how Moses interceded. When God says, I'm going to wipe them out. That's what he's talking about here. And yet, for the sake of his name, which was the basis of the pleading of Joseph. By the way, guys, if you pray on the basis of who God is and what he does, I can guarantee you, you're going to have answers. Would that we would do that. Go read Daniel's prayer in Daniel 9. Beautiful prayer. Every request is based on the character of God. And he, pray, and he prayed boldly. They're actually imperatives. He's telling, commanding God what he is to do. We say, whoo, wow. I don't know if I want to do that. Look, if it's based on God's person and what he says, you can be as bold as you want. Because if God doesn't answer, then God isn't God. Do you believe that? I hope so. I'll tell you, it'll change your prayer life when you pray on the basis of who God is and what he does. And therefore, we see that uh, truth on the part even of Moses. 
And as a result, that instead of wiping them out, that generation did not enter the land. Of course, there was a new generation that came. God, in turn, sanctified his name. Uh, he had resolved to destroy, but he didn't. The new generation, what about them? They didn't follow God either. You know, he goes on uh, in the discussions here. He says, uh, yet I... Uh, Yet I looked, verse 70, I looked upon them with pity and did not destroy them, but put an end to them in the desert. And I said to the ch their children in the desert, Do not follow the statutes of your fathers or keep their laws or defile yourself with their idols. You know, again, here's that father or son. You, can you change it? You betcha. You don't have to do what they did. Okay. I am Yahweh your God. Follow my decrees. Be careful to keep my laws. Keep my Sabbaths holy. That they may be a sign between us. Then you will know that I am Yahweh your God. But. The children rebelled against me. They did not follow my decrees. They were not careful to keep my laws. Although the man who obeys them will live by them. And they desecrated my Sabbath. So I said I would pour out my wrath on them. And spend my anger against them in the desert. But I withheld my hand for the sake of my name. I did what would keep it from being profaned in the eyes of the nations. Whose sight I had brought them out. And with uplifted hand I swore to them in the desert. That I would disperse them among the nations. And scatter them among the countries ultimately. Because they had obeyed my, had not obeyed my laws and had rejected my decrees and desecrated my Sabbaths. And their eyes uh, lusted after their father's idols. I also gave them over to statutes that were no good, that were not good, and laws they, they could not live by. That is the laws of other lands that are not good and they had to yet live by them. And let them uh, become defiled through their gifts, that is the sacrifice of their firstborn that I might fill them with a horror so that they might know that I am Yahweh. You kind of get an idea where uh, Ezekiel got that phrase? Yeah, how about the Mosaic Covenant? <laughs> you know, I want them to know who I am. So they rebelled against them. And the, in the, we have the rebellion in 27 in the conquest of the land. Therefore, son of man, speak uh, to the people of Israel and say to them, this is what uh, Adonai Yahweh says. In this also your fathers blasphemed me by forsaking me. When I brought them into the land I had sworn to give them. And they saw any high hill or any leafy tree. There they offered their sacrifices. Made offerings that provoked me to anger. Presented the fragrant incense. Poured out their drink offerings. And then I said to them, what is this high place you go to? It is called Bama to this day. Well, I think that, uh, you know, you have to, that the term Bama is the word high place. Uh, but in this case, it's used as a place name. And uh, we don't know exactly where there is, that is. I think it could likely, and this is simply my opinion, I think it could likely be the altar that you had there to the north uh, of Jerusalem that was set up. Uh, to be the altar to which they uh, went to worship uh, in those days at, the, at that particular high place that was still existence when you come later in the history of Israel during the kingdom period. Now, rebellion in Egypt, rebellion in the desert in the wilderness wandering, rebellion with the conquest and the settlement, and then we make a leap to Ezekiel's day. That's enough, kind of, he says. It's enough. Mm -hmm. I think it's verse uh, 25. Yes. And in the context, it uh, seems like it's the uh, rebellion in the wilderness wanderings. Mm -hmm. And you, you, it reads, you know, I gave them commandments that were not good and judgments. Mm -hmm. Wish they were not able to do them. Yeah. You said that that refers to foreign laws, is that correct? Well, I think in light of the fact that he's, um, um, in verse 23, that I would disperse them among the nations and scatter them among the countries because of these things, and that they will be, I will give them over to statutes that are not good and laws they could not live by. I think this is really speaking of what will alter, what the same sort of thing you're going to have later in Deut Deuteronomy 29, 30. 
that ultimately, and, and he's doing it at this point because he's just about to end and he's going to go now to Ezekiel's time. What he's doing here is simply trying to go back and give a brief history. And in just a moment is going to be interesting because he'll pick up and take the latter part of history uh, in another context. It uh, takes the brief beginning to say, this is your whole origin. This is the way it was from the very beginning. This is nothing new. This has been uh, systemic, unfortunately, for the people of Israel. This is something pervaded them. And ultimately, I think what here, he, in the midst of the revelation, is, is simply moving, saying, and ultimately, you, you'll, because when this, the fruition of this is you'll be dispersed among the nations. Just as he says in the Mosaic Covenant earlier, you'll ultimately be. And I think we have to understand that the laws he gives there, we have nothing, nothing anywhere where God's saying, here's, here's some bad things. I want, here, here's laws I want you to do, and these are really going to lead you into degradation. I think within that context, and uh, to me the context is the important factor of dispersion, they will, he, was, he will give them over to these people and they will have to deal with laws that, they don't, that aren't good for them and things that are going to make them miserable in that context. So now in 30, he, uh, he says, Therefore, say to the house of Israel, this is what Adonai Yahweh says, Will you defile yourselves the way the fathers did and lust after their vile image? So now we're going to make an application. We've seen that. We've seen what happened through the wilderness, through the conquest. Okay, guys. Right now. What about you? Are you going to do the same thing? This is the whole beginning of your people. This is what was systemic among them. What now are you going to do? And so he challenges them. Uh, you know, are you going to rebel? Are you going to defy yourself like your fathers? Uh, if so, uh, he would give them, uh, in that sense, uh, God would give them uh, an, an audience uh, to hear, and he's going to tell them exactly what he wants to tell them at this point. Notice in 32. In 32, 37, he says, though Israel uh, desires to be like idolatrous, other idolatrous countries and nations, even though they do that, God still loved them. You say, we want to be like the nations, like the people of the world who serve wood and stone. It's hard to believe they said that, but there it is. But what you have in mind will never happen. Wow. What a statement. Uh, as surely as I live, I will rule over you with a mighty and outstretched arm and with outpoured wrath. I will bring you from the nations and gather you from the countries where you have been scattered. With a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, and with outpoured wrath. This is the restoration. I see he hinted there at the dispersion as he was coming towards the end of the historical accounts of rebellion. And now he's asking them, are you, are you going to do the same thing? I know this is what you want to do. This is in your hearts. That's, what he, that's, what he, that's the question he asks in verse 30. And then in verse 32 he says, we, you say we want to be like the nations, like the people of the world who serve wood and stone. And God says, that won't happen. You're not going to be like them. That's not, that's not what my nation will do. Because I sovereignly will work and I'm going to purify you. It will be through discipline. It will be through, in that sense of judgment, of discipline. It will be a long, long, hard time. But you will come cleansed and I will restore you in my power, my mighty hand. I'll bring you into the desert of the nations and there face to face will execute the judgment upon you as I judged your fathers in the desert in the land of Egypt. So I will judge you, declares Sovereign Lord. I will take note of you as you pass under my rod and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. Now passing under the rod of the person is normally a sense, especially with a shepherd, if you're counting to make sure those are those that belong to your flock. Making you, you see them as they go by to see if they have the markings and so forth that belong to your flock. They're the ones that are going to be in the bond of the covenant. I will purge you 
of those who revolt and rebel against me. So he's going to purge the nation of the, of the rebels, of those who rebel and revolt. Although I will bring them out of the land where they are living, yet they will not enter the land of Israel. Or they'll, go into, they'll go into the dispersion and captivity, but they're not going to come back. He's going to purge them out. Then you will know that I am Yahweh. In, the, in this particular kind of beautiful statement of God's great grace. Uh, there is here a, a situation that we read that he will execute judgment upon them and your fathers and so forth. And I will take note of you as you pass by and I will purge those and bring you back in the land. As for you, O house of Israel, this is what Adonai Yahweh says. Go and serve your idols. Every one of you. But afterwards you will surely listen to me and no longer profane my holy name with your gifts and your idols. This is not that God is wanting them to, uh, to be idolatrous, but that's what they want to do. He's going to give them over. You know, we have that happening in the scripture often where God gives them over to the degradation of their sin so that they will come to the bottom and realize their need. You read the same thing in Romans 1. It's the same concept. Or, Leviticus chapter 18 yes, same. Yeah. And that's, you know, you look at that and you say, it's, it's too bad that they couldn't learn before that. And, and you're, by the way, going to see people today and your heart's going to cry out for people whom in essence God, God is saying or is allowing them, okay, you want to go this way. Okay, I'm going to let you find out where it leads. With the desire that that will show you that you need to change. And you'll return to me. And that's one of the saddest things in the world to watch. And it's going to be especially sad if it's someone very close to you. To have to see them have to endure. That by They have chosen to endure the agony in which they have self-imposed upon themselves. Because of a refusal to turn to God. And you pray for them. That they would come to their senses and see. But God's doing this. And this is what we have to understand. This is a manifestation of his love. That's hard for the non-believer to understand. But it's his grace and his love that he will allow a person to go to the depths so that they can rise from the depths and turn to him. And that's what he is doing in this particular case and will do with them. Okay, but afterwards you will surely listen to me. That's the whole goal. And no longer profane my holy name with your gifts and idols. For on my holy mountain, the high mountain of Israel, declares Adonai Yahweh, there in the land, the entire house of Israel will serve me and I will accept them. So he's looking to the future. There I will require your offerings and your choice gifts along with your holy sacrifices. I will accept you as fragrant incense and I will bring you out from the nations and gather you from the countries where you were sc have been scattered and, it, and I will show myself holy among you in the sights of the nation. Then you will know that I am Yahweh. When I bring you into the land of Israel, the land that I've sworn with uplifted hand to give to your fathers, there you will remember your conduct and all the actions which you have defiled yourself. And you will loathe yourself for all the evil that you've done. In other words, there will be confession and recognition at that time. And you will know that I am the Yahweh, when I deal with you for my name's sake and not according to your evil ways. Thank God. He does not deal with us only by our evil ways. Are your corrupt practices, O house of Israel, declares Adonai Yahweh. So, it is a, a message of application, we would say from 39 on to them. Uh, stop and consider. I know you people really want to go be like the nations. 
You want to conform to the rest of the world. And you're going to find many people in your ministry that want to do that. And by the way, you, as, as God does, you may have to just let them reap the consequences of where they're going if after a time they simply don't listen. You know, I, and, and I, let me just make one moment of that in a, very, a statement in a practical way. Having been in the pastoral ministry for more than 15 years also as well as teaching. Gentlemen, uh, there are going to be innumerable people who have problems and who are not walking in God's way. The evil one can use them to kill you, to usurp all your time and energies. Now, you want to be open when somebody wants to change. You want to be there to help the people. When a person consistently refuses, but wants to usurp all your time with nitpicky types of things, but never wants to do anything, I encourage you to let them go and let them reap the benefits. I do not see Jesus chasing people. Jesus was always available to those who wanted help. But he didn't go after people, please, oh please, oh please, you know, year after year and year. Uh, I can tell you that by experience, okay? It can use, the evil one can use that to usurp all the time of your ministry. So you cannot minister to those to whom you should be ministering. Be available. Be sensitive to the Spirit when the person really genuinely wants help. But many don't. They just want to be able to go through the whole thing again. And... Uh, it's sad. Uh, it's, it's a heartache, if you have any compassion at all, to have to see people go through the agony of the consequence of their sin. But we see here, not only here, but many places in the Scripture, this is what God does because this is what will bring them to where they will be serious and where they will deal with this <clears throat> as they come to the depths of their degradation. In that case. Now, beginning in verse 45, uh, we really have a, a new thrust that takes place here. Uh, we have uh, the judgment is going to turn and focus not so much on the nation, but it's going to focus uh, on the leadership once again. And this is going to take us through the end of chapter 21 where the uh, discipline is focused more in that particular direction. And we have here initially, uh, he says to them, Son of man, set your face toward the south. Preach against the south. Prophesy against the forest of the southland. Say to the southern forest. Oh, you get the idea he's a, he's a southerner at this point. You know, everything is south, south, south. Why is it south? Anybody know? Judah. Judah. Remember? Face east, north, east. Judah's to the south, to the right. Israel's to the north, to the left. So, he's very, just another way of saying Judah. Okay, I want you to focus on Judah. This, this message, guys, you get the point? It's going to be Judah. And uh, Judah uh, was, from all we can tell, a forested area in that time. They're trying to make it more that way again. Um, there's reasons why it's not today. When you put a bunch of goats out there on the land, you lose everything. Because uh, they, you know how a goat eats? You know, they pull the roots up. <laughs> they don't just, they, they're not a good lawnmower. <laughs> they, 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 destroy, they destroy the place in the process. Okay, so he's looking to the south. Okay, okay, what's going to be the message? What is he going to say to the forest? Hear the word of the Lord. This is what Adonai Yahweh says. I'm about to set fire to you. And it will consume all your trees, both green and dry. It will consume, uh, uh, the blazing flame will not be quenched. And every face 
from south to north, and that is encompassing the whole area, will be scorched by it. Everyone will see that I, Yahweh, have kindled it. It will not be quenched. Now this is very clear in the context, or even as the term fire has been used previously, and it is a, definitely a demonstration of judgment here. I think is here is a descriptive. He, he's using a metaphor here. The forest is Judah. The forest is going to be ignited, and every person is going to be scorched. Every tree, green and dry. And we're going to see this includes everybody, the righteous and the unrighteous. Unfortunately, uh, we sometimes hope that as righteous people, we'll never have to endure any pain. Uh, would that that were true. Uh, I don't know. I must not be very righteous if it is. Uh, and probably most of you aren't either, <laughs> if that's true. Uh, you know, we live in a sinful place. We live in a sinful world. And though we don't... Uh, we do not like sin, and we do not want to really participate in it. It is around you, and it does affect you. I mean, I don't mean by effect, but it doesn't have to change you, but you can get the consequences, be the word I'd want to use, the consequence of sin. You know, when the person is uh, sinful and gets, uh, let's suppose he gets drunk and disobeys the law and goes to the red light and runs into your car and you're injured, you get the consequence of sin. You didn't want that sin, but we live in a sinful world. We do often get the consequence, yes. Do you see any uh, reference here, uh, literally, to uh, Nebuchadnezzar using all the trees to, to burn down the wall of Jerusalem? Uh, I don't hear necessarily. Uh, obviously, he did have to use something to ignite uh, the city and burning, even as the Romans had to do later. And the, it was a forested area. Uh, so certainly could have. I just don't have any particulars that would tell me that uh, specifically here. Okay. So we have this burning. Every green and dry tree, or each person uh, will be touched by God's fury at this point. All will know that it's Yahweh who has brought the judgment. And the... the the devastation of this that, that is left upon the people uh, is very strong at this point. We go on to read in chapter 25. It actually just continues straight on through. Word of the Lord came unto me, Son of man, set your face against Jerusalem and preach against the sanctuary. Uh, prophesy uh, against the land of Israel and say to her, This is what the Lord says. I am against you. This is basically kind of interpreting the metaphor. I will draw my sword from its scabbard and cut you, cut off from you both the righteous and the wicked. Because I am going to cut off the righteous and the wicked, my sword will be unsheathed against everyone from south to north. So he's using the same south to north, every person. And then all the people will know that I, Yahweh, have drawn the sword from its scabbard and it will not return again. You know, everybody will know that I kindled the fire. Well, by using another imagery, everybody will know I pulled out the sword. And, uh, and the same results are happening. Notice the re the what, how the people, how this will affect them. Therefore, groan, son of man. Groan before them with broken heart and bitter grief. And when they ask you, why are you groaning? You should say to them, because of the news that is coming, every heart will melt and every hand go limp, every spirit will become faint, every knee will become weak as water. It's coming. It will surely take place, declares Adonai Yahweh. The emotional response of the people is it just it wipes them out. They, their, their hearts melt. Their hands go limp. Their spirits faint. Their knees feel like water. I don't know if you've ever been in that emotional situation. I hope not too often. But probably most of us have been in that place where we just feel, you know, just totally zapped. 
in that context. And that's how the people are going to be when it happens. They can't believe it. And it just emotionally is shattering to them. Mm -hmm. um, isn't this a contrast with the angelic executions of uh, Ezekiel 8 to 11? That in Ezekiel 8 to 11, uh, the, the people in Jerusalem who were mourning over the detestable things marked and they were spared from the execution by the angelic executioners. Mm -hmm. But here in, Ex in Ezekiel 20, uh, God is saying that both the righteous and the wicked will be, will be slaughtered. He says it's going to affect them both, uh, and e each person. Uh, I, yes, that seems to be from a contradictory situation. And I think we have to grapple with that. I think uh, solutions that we can deal with that would be in the sense that when the one is marked as a righteous person, they certainly have a relationship with God that will never end. There is a protection in that sense. In that sense, we move it more out of the immediate physical into a longer term situation. Uh, that every, uh, every single individual is going to be touched with the judgment that comes in the imagery that's given here, both with the fire and the sword, uh, we already know that there is going to be, the, like the dividing of the hair, that not everyone will be touched. We already, that there will, we already know there will be a dispersion, and that dispersion takes place. So I think when we come, therefore, to a passage like this, we need to keep the metaphor uh, fully to the sense that God's going to bring judgment upon the whole land, and it will affect each person. Notice when, when, it, uh, when it says, uh, when it speaks of, of each face, every face will be scorched by it. Doesn't necessarily say they'll all be burned uh, and die at that point. Uh, every tree, green, the dry and green, is going to definitely uh, be uh, approached, but then he uses the concept of of the scorching, not necessarily the whole. I'm going to cut off uh, everyone from north to south. And I'm going to draw my sword, will be unsheathed against everyone. Doesn't again mean uh, that each individual will have to die. So I recognize at that point we're taking the, I'm taking the text to say I'm going to take it what it says and not make it uh, become, ex you might say, extreme one way or the other, to say, well, it says all, but it's going to be everybody, or it's going to be nobody. But I, I do think we have to let the text uh, be held to what it says. And uh, it doesn't demand that every individual go. And the remnants are always going to be small. That's our, you know, the hem and the garment. It's just a very few. So I'm not particularly sure that it's contradictory, though certainly it, on the surface it, you know, it certainly has that appearance. But I think as a metaphor, both of the sword uh, and of the fire, that it's giving the general perspective that the whole area is going to be, God's going to bring his judgment against them. Now, when we come to, uh, in 21, uh, verse, uh, we, we come down to verse 8. We now have a new poetic song that he's going to sing against them. He has, a, he has talked about the burning of the southern forest. He's now going to talk about the, uh, what I call the uh, sword song here. A uh, poetic song about a sword. He continues that idea of a sword in verse 8. The Lord came to me and he said, Son of man, prophesy. Say, this is what... Uh, Yahweh says and then he gives this thing a sword a sword sharpened and polished sharpened for the slaughter polished to, fl to flash like lightning and uh, he goes he says we shall we rejoice in the scepter of my son Judah the sword despises every such stick and he goes on the the sword picture here is a is a sword that a, a sword a sword <laughs> Uh, that is sharpened, that is uh, polished, that is ready for the slaughter, and it is work, working with the speed of lightning here. And the hand, of course, as we're going to see, uh, basically it's in the hand, as, we're, as the rest of the text has told us, in the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. Obviously, ultimately, it's God's sword, but he's using the instrumentality 
of Nebuchadnezzar uh, in, the, in the text. And what's uh, Ezekiel's response uh, for this? Uh, when it's done, he says, Cry out and wail, son of man, for it's against my people. It's against all the princes of Israel. So here it's primarily, especially the leadership. They are thrown to the sword along with my people. Therefore, beat your breast. Testing will surely come. And the testing, by the way, relates to the people, not to the sword, uh, grammatically, to the nearest antecedent. The people will be, so to speak, tested and found wanting at this point. And it's going to come. And what if the scepter of Judah, which is the sword despises, does not continue? Well, it will. The scepter will be continue. Why? Why does the scepter continue in Judah? The Davidic covenant, absolutely. And God is faithful to his covenants. Not because of the people, otherwise I'll wipe out. Does this mean that every person in the line of David is going to live and not experience judgment? Why? The Davidic covenant. <laughs> Thank you. Right back to the same thing. The Davidic covenant says if one of these guys does what's wrong, goes astray, he will be disciplined. <laughs> But there will always be one in the line. Uh, God is so it's it's God is so faithful, so wonderful to watch uh, what He does. You know why we doubt His word is uh, well. That's interesting. You know why do we doubt His word? Uh, we really shouldn't, in that sense, as we constantly see the faithfulness of God as He works these things. So uh, we. We have this sword that comes through in the sword song and the scepter of the Messiah will not be, in that sense, extinguished in any way. Actually, in the midst of this, that's the bright statement of hope. Your hope is God's faithful to his Davidic covenant. The scepter will be there. The Messiah will be there. That's your only hope in the process. And so in verse uh, 14, son of man, strike your hands together. That, that is, uh, applaud, please. Okay. okay. Let the sword, uh, strike your hands together uh, and let the sword strike twice, even three times. Now again, this is the multiplicity means the thing increases. It's even more than one. Uh, it's it's uh, coming with all of its uh, of what you, you can do two and three times as much as what the sword might normally do in its context. Ezekiel's clapping his hands uh, with approval of the judgment appears. I don't think he's sitting there saying, oh boy, this is great. I couldn't wait till they got zapped. Uh, we've already seen he's crying out more than once. We already had Ezekiel, you know, uh, weeping and wailing. And, and, and this is a concern to him. So it's not that, it's a sense of clapping with approval, but with scorn and uh, with contempt for the iniquity uh, that is there. In verse, in verse 14, he says, let it strike uh, two or three times at the sword of slaughter, the sword of great slaughter, closing in on them from every side. So that many, so that hearts may melt and the, and the fallen may be many. I have stationed the sword for slaughter at all their gates. Oh, it, may, it was made to flash like lightning. It's grass for slaughter. The sword is to slash to the right and to the left wherever your blade is turned. I too will strike with my hands together and my wrath will subside. I, Yahweh, have spoken. And verse 17 makes it very clear that really ultimately the sword is in the hand of God. It's his judgment, though he uses those like Nebuchadnezzar. Now, the judgment is very imminent as we come to verses 18 to 27 in, uh, in Ezekiel 21. Uh, the sword song is now uh, integrated with a reinforced uh, symbolic action that takes place. And our symbolic action that takes place is, Son of man, mark out two roads. So he's now we got, here he is, you know, he, earlier he described things on a, on a brick. Now he's going to uh, draw us another little picture. He's going to draw a map. Okay, So he draws this map. Uh, and he says, Mark out two roads for, this, for, the sword of the Lord, for the sword of the king of Babylon. That's why we know that the sword's in his hand. But it's really ultimately in God's hands. But he's using Babylon. Uh, 
two roads for the sword of the king of Babylon to take, both starting from the same country. Make a signpost where the brand, road branches off to the city. So we're going to come to a fork in the road. Okay, got a map, got a fork in the road, and we're going to have a signpost right there. Okay, what happens at the signpost? Mark out one road for the sword to come against Rabbah the, of the Ammonites. Okay, okay, one way is going to go. He's coming from the north, so one way is going to go to the left towards uh, Rabbah Tamun. And the other way against Judah and fortified Jerusalem. So, signpost says to Rabat Amon to Jerusalem. Okay? Uh, these are your options. Which way do I go at the fork of the road? Because both had rebelled. Okay? Texts tell us, Jeremiah as well as Ezekiel and then the historical texts, both have rebelled. Okay? Which do I go first here? I'm at, I'm at this point. So, uh, for the king of Babylon will stop at the fork in the road at the junction of the two roads to seek an omen. Uh, he's going to use the divination, which the, the common things of the day. He's going to say, okay, I've got a, which way do I go on the fork in the road? Do I go right or go left? Okay, so I'm going to use my uh, different types of omens and divination. He will cast lots with arrows. Okay. What they do, they mark an arrow and they put it in the quiver and they take the quiver and they swing it around. The first one to fly out is the one you go. Okay? The one that's marked that way. He would consult his idols. Idols were certainly uh, inquired of. I'm not sure how they answered <laughs> since they can't talk. Uh, but anyhow, they were inquired of. to find. And he will examine the liver. Now, when they examine the livers, they look for different markings and for different colorations on them. This was a very common uh, part of uh, their seeking to know things. We might say it's kind of strange when people today go in to see, um, you know, spiritists and so forth for the same sorts of things. Uh, now, into his right hand will come the lot for Jerusalem. So they must have been casting lots also. Where he is to set up the battering rams and give the command uh, to slaughter. To sound the battle cry, to set the battle rams against the city, to build a ramp and erect siege works. It will seem like a false omen to those who have sworn allegiance to him. But he will remind them of their guilt and take them captive. Now the, the point here is they have an alliance because of their vassals, an alliance with Nebuchadnezzar. And it's going to seem to them, what's the deal? Hey, man, we, 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 signed, on the, we signed on the dotted line here, you know, in, in our treaty agreement. But we've already heard, and we're going to hear again, they have broken their treaty, their alliance relationships with Nebuchadnezzar. So initially... You know, it's probably the cry, unfair, not fair, why us? Why do we get to be the first one? You know, but uh, he's coming uh, upon them anyhow in this situation. It will seem like that, he says, but he will remind them of their guilt and take them captive. And this will be, of course, the third deportation. Therefore, this is what Adonai Yahweh says, beginning in uh, 24. At this point, he's going to give the judicial sentence upon them. He says, uh, Jerusalem, he's going to say here, Jerusalem will be seized because you people have brought into your mind your guilt by your, lot, uh, by your open rebellion, revealing your sins and all that you do. Because you've done this, you will be taken captive. They're going to go into captivity at that point. Verse 25, O profane and wicked prince of Israel, who is that? Zedekiah. He's the prince or the nasi or the leader uh, whose day has come, whose time as punishment has reached its climax. This is what Adonai Yahweh says. Take off the turban and remove the crown. Who, were, who wears the turban? The high priest. Who wears the crown? The kingship and the high priestly ship are going to be removed. Okay, and uh, those obviously are not going to return again and together again until the end time because he says it will not be as it was. 
The lowly will be exalted. The exalted will be brought low. A ruin, a ruin. I'll make it a ruin. It will not be restored until he comes to whom it rightly belongs. To whom I will give it. Now that, that phraseology has, it kind of gives us a ring to us. It's like, I, I think I've heard something like that before. Where have where we, where we heard a similar phrase? Genesis 49, until Shiloh comes. Okay. So the high priesthood and the, and the kingship are removed until the one comes to who it rightfully belongs. The one who is the king, priest, the Messiah. Okay. And this tells us that really the discipline that's taking place now though there is a restoration from Babylon, is not just looking near, it's looking at the fact that really, for Israel, they're not fully cleansed, and there will not be full restoration till the end times. Okay. And the prophets will do this. They'll, they'll <laughs> we might say, kind of drop these hints or drop these little nuggets right in the midst of a contemporary situation that also focuses you to the future. Do they give you any timeline particulars? Absolutely not. They're talking conceptually. What are they talking about here? Hey, the high priesthood and the kingship are going to be removed and it will not be back until it comes both to the one to whom it's rightly due, the Messiah who will come. So they're in a conceptual discussion. They're not in a chronological discussion at that time. 20, uh, verses 28 and following are interesting because uh, the Lord says, uh, say about Ammonites and their insults. Now we're going to very quickly see when we come to 25 that one, the major reason for the judgment upon the nations is because of what they and how they insult and mistreat and mock and deal with Judah when they're down when they God when judgments being brought upon them their ungodly responses but this is not a judgment on Ammon we're gonna this is just you know, someone you might say a little, a little statement of things to come uh, in here at the beginning of verse 28. That, that judgment's going to come in chapter 25, beginning of chapter 25, where it's going to be stated. But here he's going to use their song of the Ammonites, their taunts against and their mocking of, of Judah as a statement there of judgment upon Judah. And that's what he does in those final verses there. The uh, the song is speaking of the sword that uh, will come, and the conclusion that will come, and and we it says it's a sword, it's drawn for slaughter. It's kind of a repetition of what we've already had of the sword song, but it's being sung by Ammon in reference to, in a proper sense, the judgment that will come upon Judah. Verse thirty: Return the sword to its scabbard in the place where you where you were created. Now. Who's, who's got the scabbard here that's actually initiating this? Who's actually executing this? Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon. So we're going to, uh, when, when this is done, it's going to be returned to the scabbard in the place where it's created in the land of your ancestry, and I will judge you. Who's you? Hmm? Well, it's Nebuchadnezzar. I'm going to judge you. We, you know, Ezekiel talks about judgments of the nations, but he will not, he does not talk in detail about Babylon. But here is the glimpse. Babylon, you also, when this is all over, you also will be judged. Now, you know, we have those statements in Isaiah and we have them in Jeremiah that talk about the judgment quite much more extensively about Babylon. Ezekiel really doesn't deal with that at all because, and interestingly, and the statement upon the foreign nations. That's not his emphasis. But we do have these little glimpses every once in a while that are there 
on his part. I will pour out my wrath upon you and breathe out my fury against you and I will hand you over to brutal men and men, will, uh, men skilled in destruction. You'll be fuel for the fire and your blood will be shed in your land and you'll be remembered no more for I, the Lord, have spoken. Now, we come to 22. And we're still uh, dealing with the issue of judgment's coming and why it's coming. And I don't know about you, about this time I started getting tired of this. <laughs> oh, come on, Ezekiel. You know, how many times we got to go over this again? You know, I think we, uh, I hope we're getting it <laughs> in the process. You got a question? Before we got too far down the road, I just wanted to go back to verse 10. That was true. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, verse 27. Yeah. It was promised the restoration of the king and priest in Israel mm -hmm. when the Messiah comes. Of course, Messiah has come, but mm -hmm. the, the king and priest has not been restored to Israel. So how much can we make of this verse with regard to God's promises to Israel of restoration in the millennium when Christ returns the second time? as compared to those who believe Israel and the church are the same, and there is no promise to Israel in one. Well, the fact that uh, in his first advent, we do not have him uh, executing uh, in the prophetic way his kingly rule nor his uh, full priestly role. I think we have to say in the, that uh, this points out very clearly something we don't have in the Old Testament, and that is that we have a first and second advent. Uh, that's very clear when we come to the New Testament. So this is this is further revelation. I don't think it therefore takes away uh, from the truth of the fact that he will uh, receive this and it will not uh, be restored to him because it isn't until he comes at the second coming. That doesn't do away with the fact of his first advent. That point. I think here we have simply further revelation on that point. Um, that's the way I would approach. That matter. Okay, as we uh, come to 22, uh, I hope you've also seen, and th this chapter will probably work as much as any on this fact, is that the abominations of the nation, they are full, they are basically, let me go back and say, the judgment is because they have disobeyed the Mosaic Covenant their constitution. The judgments that is brought upon them, the discipline, are those which are mentioned in the Mosaic Covenant. Nothing new in that sense, really. It's just explaining kind of how and who the how it's going to be executed and so forth, and reiterating to the people the truth of what God's already told them about what they should, how they should live righteously, and what, and what unrighteous living is, and that they have been living unrighteously. And therefore, the discipline comes. He does stress, and we've seen that uh, periodically over and over again, that those that are most accountable are constantly mentioned as being those that give leadership, are the leaders. And as I've said to you again, I think this points to the importance of leadership. I mean, you can go throughout the whole scripture. That's another interesting study. Study the concept of leadership from the point of view of what God says and thinks about leaders. Uh, I think it will have a great effect upon your own personal life if you do that. Uh, read about how they're evaluated in the books of Kings. What are the standards of evaluation? You know, actually, the standards go back to Deuteronomy 17. So we can't get away from those they covenant. See, go back to Deuteronomy 17, and the standards there, uh, which are spiritual standards. Okay, uh, with that we evaluated all leadership that way, and and we need to evaluate our own leadership in that way. If God places us in a leadership place. But Ezekiel makes it clear that the leaders, the contemporary leaders, uh, the leaders throughout, are a, a responsible group, not that the rest of the nation is, gets off the hook because they shouldn't have followed. Okay? But the leaders have led them astray. 
So we have judgment messages that are given here. And as we begin in 22 and verse 3, we have an accusation that is given that uh, continues on for some time. And I think it's very instructive. And in 3, he says, uh, and, you know, O city that brings on herself doom by shedding blood in her midst and defiles herself by making idols. By the way, please note that... Uh, Idolatry, religious uh, uh, apostasy, almost invariably throughout Ezekiel and many texts results in violence and bloodshed. You know, there's, there, there's relationships there. And that's not something I don't think the world would normally think of. But if you move away from God, there's going to be violence and there's going to be bloodshed. Uh, we have this dear lady uh, and I think I mentioned earlier in the week in uh, Moscow whose father was a confidant to Stalin who has become a believer exciting believer and she's, and she's the one that said to us you know God you know our hearts were turned away from the character of God for 70 years and we're now reaping the consequence uh, in that and uh, in, in that situation, uh, we see that uh, we see the, the turmoil and the, and the degradation that take its place. I, I see that in Moscow every day. You know, you don't read about it in the papers here, but we have assassinations that take place in Moscow almost daily. And there's a lot of bloodshed. It's not in the papers there. It's not in the papers here. Well, it is in the papers there every once in a while. And that's the people of all stratas. You know, you can have a dear woman of that in the Bolshoi that has come to Christ and God's and uh, her husband. This now was about five years ago. He owned a building and uh, when people came and wanted to get the purchase the building from him, he didn't want to sell the building. So they roughed him up a bit. He still didn't want to sell the building, so they simply eliminated him. You know, now I realize things like that go on here also. But it's the result of spiritual moving away from God. You know, it, it, the effect ends up in violence and bloodshed regardless of where you are. These are just some examples. It's true throughout the world. Uh, and I don't think we often, uh, certainly the world doesn't make this connection at all of the relationship bet uh, between the two that take place. So there's bloodshed and, and murder of various ways that are taking place in Jerusalem, in Judea on this point. You have become, verse 4, guilty because of the blood you've shed. You've become defiled by the idols you've made. You've brought your days to a close and your ears and the end of your years has come. Therefore I will make you an object of scorn to the nations and a laughing stock to all the countries. Those who are near and those who are far away will mock you, O oh, infamous, infamous city, full of turmoil. See how each of the princes of Israel who are in you uses his power to shed blood. Now, verses 6 to, 9, uh, to 12, please note these verses. Go back and think about them sometime. I just want to briefly go through them because they're discussing what are the abominations of the leaders. What are the things that they are doing wrong? And I hope we can learn from what people do wrong in this text to know what we need to do right. Okay? Notice. Uh, they shed blood and they misuse, misuse their power. We just mentioned that one. Verse 7. A shows that they ignore the rightful place and authority of parents. You ever think about that? Leadership is doing that. Is that happening in this country? Okay. Okay. And thus it destroys the home. 7b, second part of 7. They are socially taking advantage of the helpless people. Where he says... You've oppressed the alien and mistreated the fatherless and the widow. Mosaic Covenant speaks very explicitly 
to that. Are we doing that? See? That's the wrong things for a leader to be doing. They're indifferent to those they rule. Notice he says, You have despised my holy things and desecrated my Sabbaths. In you are slanderous men bent on shedding blood. In you are those who eat at the mountain shrines and commit lewd acts. They have allowed these religious pagan practices to go on in their country. They are indifferent to the holy things of God. And as a result, they are indifferent to the people for whom they are to care. So they've engaged, they engage in heathen ritual practices in the process. In the latter part, of, uh, they, we also, slanderous men is, uh, could actually be, could, re could be rendered for us, uh, they're informers who carry out the premeditated murders uh, within the country that takes place. Uh, the end of verse uh, 9, uh, you commit lewd acts, and you are those who dishonor their father's bed, and you are those who violate women during their period, when they are ceremonially unclean. In you, one man commits the detestable offense with his neighbor's wife, and another shamefully defiles his daughter-in-law, and another violates his sister, his own father's daughter. Well, these guys are also involved in sexual sins as leaders. It's part of what it... And, and men, uh, be on the guard and have other men that will help you to accountability in that. Boy, and don't ever come to Russia without your wife. Let me just tell you something that was in the newspaper in Moscow. Just, I'll tell you why I said that. About a year and a half ago, there was an article on the survey they did with young teenage girls in Moscow. Okay? Asking them, what is your future vocational desire? 70% that is a vocational desire to be a mistress to an expat. That's mind-blowing. It's an aggressive sexual attack in that city. And I tell you, I've seen many men fall. Okay? I'm glad that that's not necessarily the aggressiveness that we have in some cities, but it is aggressive here also. And uh, be on guard. Find men to be hold you accountable. That when you're going places alone, go with some other man or do. Take all precautions you can. No one is. Uh, no one uh, says, "Well, it'll never happen to me." At that point, you're in real trouble. If you think it won't. But here, you know, I'm talking this because these are leaders. Look at what they're doing. Their sexual sins here. It's an area that uh, that uh, they were they were being ruined in in their context uh, they are prospering for unprofitable look in 11 in one man pardon me not 11 in, in 12 you accept bribes to shed blood you take usury and excessive interest to make unjust gains from your neighbors by extortion they're out for unjust gain in the whole process. How does all this add up? How do you summarize it? You have forgotten me. Okay. So, what he says, God gives his verdict. He will vent his fury upon them in dispersion. Uh, God himself uh, he claps his hands in uh, disapproval and at this point. Uh, they are going to be uh, brought to verdict because of uh, their dishonest gain for their murder. There will be dispersion. There will be cleansing. And there will be uh, the whole purpose that they will know Yahweh. So he's again pointing out it's the leaders that have modeled for the people. And of course, you know in the scripture that uh, as elders we are to be examples and models that we're in that position of a leadership within the church. Leaders are to be models. You will model. Do you hear what I said? You will model. Whether you like it or not. The question is, what are we modeling at that point? 
and people are looking. They're looking at your life. You live in glass houses. People listen to things. They watch things. We have people in Moscow who come and they say to their friends, their Russian friends, I, I notice that, that you all are married and you still love each other. Can we come uh, to this thing? You, you, you have something you call a Bible study and where couples are. Can we just come to see people that still love each other and are together for more than two years? Well, of course, whoop, too bad. When they come, they're now made connection. They're on their journeys. They'll come to Christ for soon. That's the exciting thing because the main thing in evangelism is making the contact, guys. And uh, then it's uh, they're on their journey and you get to watch that. Same thing happened with a woman, the, one of the new Russians, new Russian, one of those, uh, the more wealthy Russians today, uh, for two months watched one of the women in our church in a park. And he, she came up to her one day and says, you know, I've been watching you for two months, how you work with your children. And uh, I've never seen anything like it. Can I come, just come to your home and observe what you do? Looking for models. They're watching. What are they seeing in our lives, guys? What are they seeing in our families? Uh, we are witnessing. That's the, we could say this, there'd be, I'm sure, hundreds of stories like that here. Uh, people are just watching. They're looking for the model. There's a void, as he goes on to conclude this chapter, of righteous leaders here. There's a, uh, a failure in Judah society, especially with their leaders. Uh, verse 24, uh, as we come here, he says, Son of man, say to the land, you are a land that has had no rain or showers in the day of wrath. There is a conspiracy of her princes within her like a roaring lion tearing its prey. They devour people. They take treasures and precious things and make many widows within her. That's because the husbands are killed. Her priests do violence to my law and profane my holy things. They do not distinguish between the holy and the common. They teach that there's no difference between the clean and the unclean. And they shut their eyes to keeping my Sabbaths. So I am profaned among them. You see, he, he's talking to them uh, here about their description and there are here, in this case, uh, leaders. Actually, the, the Hebrew text, it's, it's a problem here, whether it's prophets initially or princes that are being talked to uh, as we come in verse 25. Her, uh, and when it says there's a conspiracy of her princes, uh, later they talk about prophets. So some would take this as uh, being uh, leaders or princes, but to do so we would have to change the text. So there's no problem with leaving this at prophets. Uh, they're like roaring lions that are tearing prey and devouring people and so forth. Many people are made widows. What do the priests do? Notice the priests violate the Mosaic Covenant. They fail to observe or teach the observance between what's holy and what is profane. They disregard the Sabbaths. They give poor instruction. And what they give is given for monetary gain. It can be for profits. I hope that's not what we do in the ministry. Her prophets, 28, whitewash these deeds for them by false visions and lying divinations. We've already learned about the whitewashing. You know, make it all look good by saying the things they want to hear and the visions which the, the, that they make up in their mind. The false visions and the lying divinations. And they say, this is what, the, this is what Adonai Yahweh says. When Yahweh has not spoken, the people of the land practice extortion and commit robbery. They oppress the poor and the needy and mistreat the aliens, denying them justice. And that's something, by the way, the prophets talk about greatly. The denial of justice to people in the land. So he says, I looked for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of my people on behalf of the land so that I would not have to destroy it. But I found none. There are no leaders. There are no righteous leaders. There's no one here as a leader who will protect 
the people. Gentlemen, I hope you will be leaders who will protect your people. Hope you'll be those who will stand in the gap for your people. Be like a Moses who stood there in Exodus 14 and stood in the gap for his nation. Unfortunately, at Ezekiel's time, there were no leaders. None for them. 